We are seeing these statements of the new Pentecost and millennium of unifications actualized in our times. My doctoral thesis speaks about these very themes, in particular of a mystic who has been called in modern times to serve the Church. Her name is the Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, how's everyone doing, and where are you from? Rhode Island. Welcome from Rhode Island. France. Bonjour. Merci. I'm from Austria. Yeah, Austria. Yeah. Good. Good in Morgan. Thank <laughs> you. Iowa. Oh. Iowa. How you doing? All. <laughs> How you all doing? <laughs> That's a beautiful wrestling country. Corn country. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. The Hawkeye. Germany. Germany. Welcome. Thank you. And Father, I'm logged in. I'm at the great state of Kentucky. Me and the family wow. were seeing the Noah's Ark experience, the Noah's Ark encounter down Ooh. here. They have live animals and stuff. So the little one's very excited about that. That's amazing. Now, I truly believe that Ararat holds the real Ark. And I also believe it's just my personal opinion based on whatever information I came across that one of the last Romanovs, I think her name is Anastasia, has an actual relic of that gopher wood from the ark. Nonetheless, yeah, I mean, all the indication seems to show that that is the place I was at at the true ark, but there's an exhibition there in Con Connecticut, huh? Kentucky, down here in God's Kentucky. country. Kentucky, yeah. Oh, the heart of the United States. Uh -huh. Isn't that like spot That's in the right. middle? <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely. Fantastic. I'll let you know how it is. Thank you. All right. So what I'd like to do right away, since the last two days, I did most of the talking. <clears throat> Yesterday, I opened up for about 20 minutes of quick Q&A. Today, I think we'll start with a little introduction. And then if you have any questions on the divine will, feel free to ask, as well as any questions on the status of the church, as well as this holy week in which we are living in this culmination period of the liturgy of the church. You know. Christ, when he was condemned to death, he was condemned on Trump charges, fake charges, because they wanted to find an excuse, as the Gospel of John says, to kill him. And because his time had not yet come, they could not. In other words, God is in control of all human history and even the events therein. So God permitted this <coughs> cat and mouse game, so to speak, this... Um, threat that constantly loomed over the head of our Lord, so that through the cross, those who were open to the shepherd's voice might follow him and be saved. So Christ was to set the example for us to follow, and that example was for him to be persecuted like a fugitive, finally captured, arrested, 
flogged, um, laden with a cross, crucified for about six or so hours and finally die. And um, you had after midnight a false court assembly among the Sanhedrin and you had Caiaphas and Annas and um, it was illegal. They violated the Mosaic law because they were not supposed to assemble after midnight. Number one, number two, they were supposed to have the full assembly of the Sanhedrin, which they did not have. So that was a second violation of the Mosaic law, rendering the court invalid. The third violation was that they invented the charges. And there were three principal charges against our Lord that they basically made up. One that he made himself, what was it, that he blasphemed, right? Because he said he was the son of God. Remember, for the Jews, you couldn't even um, familiarize yourself with God. He was so sacred. And for you to say that you're his son or one with him was to them a blasphemy, but it wasn't because Christ was indeed God. The second charge was that he was perverting the nations and refusing to pay the temple tax, which is false. Because as you know, he had Peter go and fetch a statement from a fish's mouth and had him pay that, even though the, he was exempt from it. And the third false charge was that he declared himself a king. It's false because it was a king. <laughs> so when Pilate confronted him and asked him so, he replied by saying that if I was a king of this earth, my angels would have defended me, but my kingdom is not of this earth. And therefore <clears throat> they threatened Pilate that if he didn't crucify him, that he would be basically deposed. And Pilate, to save his skin, turned him over to them. And they said, may his blood be on us and on our ch children. That's sort of like a curse upon the whole Jewish nation. And St. Hanabali Francia, in his reflections of the hours of the Passion, says that we should pray for them as well, the Jews, because of this stigma that they called upon themselves now. This has nothing to do with the Indians who are Jewish. It's not has nothing to do with their system or their race. This has to do with the Jews back at the time of Christ, who literally betrayed God and crucified him by allowing the Roman centurions to put him to death and actually they paid him along with Judas to do so. That's the scene we are facing today. And of course, about six days ago, he was he was two million Jews welcomed him on Palm Sunday and laid out their branches before the bowl upon whom no male had ever ridden. And um, within six days, they were all mocking him for the most part, uh, as he was dragged along the filthy streets of Jerusalem up to the outside the gates where he would die as a criminal after he was excommunicated by Caiaphas when he tore his garment, that was a gesture of excommunication. So that's the context of today's liturgy. And all the churches are stripped and are darkened because it's a, it brings to the fore that Christ is truly and was truly in the tomb and dead. Now, Christ said during his public ministry that just as Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days, so must the son of man be in the belly of the earth for three days. So he was in the tomb for three days. Some say he wasn't in the belly of the earth, he was in the tomb. Well, actually he was in the belly of the earth. According to mystical literature, purgatory is very close to hell. Now it's not physically in the center of the earth because you can bore all you want and go there, you won't find anything. With God, there are dimensions within dimensions. So you have, for example, in the Book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden with four rivers, all of which converge in the area of the, in the Middle East. We know the Tigris is there, the Euphrates is there, but then you have the Pishkov, which has never been found, and, um, and the, um, I get the third name of the river back then in Hebrew, but that's never, that one has not quite been located. 
Oh yeah, no, you have the Tigris, the Pit of the Nile. No, not the, the Tigris, the Euphrates. Yeah. And then people have tried to go to archaeologists to locate where Eden was, but they couldn't find it because it's in another dimension. Okay. Same thing with heaven, purgatory, hell. They may coincide with a ge geographical coordinate, but it doesn't mean that if you go there, you will have access to it because it exceeds our three-dimensional reality, okay? Having said that, Jesus went into the belly of the earth where limbo was. And there, according to the writings of Louisa, he showed himself in his crucified form, all massacred and bloodied. And you can imagine how many people were there for him to greet, billions, right? For the, for the last 4,000 years of the righteous. And then <clears throat> here's the interesting part. For 40 days, he and they appeared and disappeared and instructed people. But we don't know what they taught the people. We know what Christ taught in part, at least that's what's, what is mentioned in the scriptures. But they all did not ascend with Christ to heaven for 40 days, right? Because when he ascended at Bethany 40 days later, that's when Louisa Picaretta describes all of them ascending with him. So Christ did not ascend alone. He ascended with all these souls, billions of souls with him at Bethany. That, was, that must have been quite a sight to see. But here's the mystery. On the cross, Jesus says to the good thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. Well, if, here's the question. If they didn't all ascend with Christ for 40 days, how could he say this day you will be with me in paradise? <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess? Oops. Well, here's, the, here's a witty answer, but it doesn't really apply. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. But that, they didn't wait a thousand years. But with God, the word day is not necessarily confined to a 24 hour cycle. In fact, Jesus tells this to Louisa in respect to creation. He tells her that when the heavens and the earth were created, there were no days at the time of Adam and Eve, right? There were no days, there were no 24 hour cycles. It was one perpetual day, Eden. So he says they were epics, a day, in the scripture, in the day, in the act of creation were epics. Epics could be thousands to millions of years. But um, Peter says that not in relation to creation, but in relation to God's time, a day can also mean eternity, a thousand years. Okay, So we really don't know the answer to that. Nor does Louisa or any other mystic, mystic talk about when the good thief literally accompanied our Lord into heaven. But I would imagine that this is what happened, but this is just my theological speculation based on what I've learned from this event, that the good thief went into limbo and Christ was there to welcome him. He could have died shortly after Christ. He was probably, oh no, he died before Christ, the scripture relates. Because when the centurion went to break all three legs, he saw the other two were dead, he broke their legs. Then he went to Christ, right? And he didn't break his leg. So he had already been dead, so he was in limbo, so Christ went to meet with him. And then he went with all these righteous, the patriarchs and the prophets, Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and so forth. And he was preaching with them the good news. And then he ascended with Christ into heaven after 40 days. That's just my, my personal opinion. But I'll open the floor now to any questions you may have with respect to our approach to unity that I talked about yesterday and the day before, with respect to the vertical line, the horizontal line, the amoris, the caritas, and how we are to exemplify the one commandment in the gospel that Christ gave us in order to establish this divine will reign on earth and of peace and unity. And then I will go into a little bit of the encyclical that I mentioned yesterday, Patris in Terra, Terra, 
which to me is the greatest work from the church on peace among brethren. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday, it goes into the different rights we all enjoy as Christians. We have rights of moral and cultural values. We have rights to worship God according to our conscience. We have the right to choose freely one state in life, the right to economic rights, the right to meeting and association of speech, of political rights, of duties, of reciprocity between persons, mutual collaboration, responsibilities of truth, justice, freedom, uh, exercising the virtues and the moral order in society, the equality of each individual, and then it goes into the relations between individuals and public authorities. Now, here's why I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we can, in these troublesome times, work for unity when there's disunity sown, for the most part, by these globalists, those in authority that are making decisions for nations, and not of all of them are for the betterment of the citizens. In 46, Article 46 of this document by Pope John the 23rd, who's now a saint, entitled Pacem Interis, um, it states, he states, human society can be neither well-ordered nor prosperous without the presence of those who invested with legal authority preserve its institutions, including the church it's instituted by Christ, and do all that is necessary to sponsor activity, the, actively the interests of all its members. And they derive their authority from God. So St. Paul teaches there is no power but from God. And St. John Chrysostom comments on this passage, passage as follows. What are you saying? Is every ruler appointed by God? No. That is not what I mean, he says, for I am not now talking about individual rulers, but about authority as such. My contention is that the existence of a ruling authority, the fact that some should command and others obey, and that all things not come about as the result of blind chance, this is a prov prov provision of divine wisdom. So here St. John Chrysostom is saying that when Paul says that all there is no power but from God, he's not condoning the exercise thereof by evil dictators. He's rather saying that the authority as a power in and of itself, that position of authority and the person that occupies it is willed by God, permitted. Now there's two types of willing by God. There's a um, desiring or deliberate willing, God wants it. He, can, he condones it. Then there's a permitting or permissive willing from God. He does not condone it, but he allows it. Like the original sin, like the rebellion of the angels, like our sins. If you have an evil dictator or ruler of a government or even a bad president, God does not will that. That's what St. John Chrysostom is saying, but he's saying that God has permitted it, and God never, this is the teaching of Augustine, God never allows anyone to have a position in life, be it a state in life of marriage, priesthood, religious life, po politics, uh, labor, without giving them the grace to fulfill that faithfully. Okay. Now, suppose there's a little extenuating circumstance I wish to address. Suppose a person has a mistaken vocation. They're not properly formed and they're, they're, their position is accelerated. Let's take, for example, bad governments. They put bad people in charge and they're not prepared for the task. They don't have the competency, they don't have the maturity, they don't have the responsibility, and they don't have the moral courage to stand their ground. They're just put there to do what they're told, like marionettes or puppets. Does God give them all the grace to fulfill that role? On this condition, he does. That they live in his grace. That's a big requirement for some of these. Most of them don't. So if they live in his grace, then he will start to give them that maturity little by little. But the problem is, if they're not living in his grace, they won't have the grace to fulfill that role. 
And that sadly is oftentimes the case. So I mention this because the unity among people, it's affected by those at the top, be it of all institutions, state or church. Having said that, I want to go back to what I said on day one of the Triduum. Louisa suffered from some priests who were in authority in the church because they were not coming for days to help free her from her state of immobility and rigidity. Many did, some did not. And I address in my translation the names of those. There were quite a few that supported her, at least a dozen, and they were in her hometown, and except from Hannibal. But those that wouldn't come, she would really make her upset. And she wanted to resent it, but she knew the Lord didn't want that sentiment, so she had to fight against it, as she says. But then later on, she adds that the priest will never be mistaken if the soul is obedient, as if to incriminate herself. The priest will never be mistaken if the soul is obedient. Here she's talking about a rapport between a spiritual director or a confessor and either the directee or the penitent. That's a powerful statement. That's like, it's a guarantee. So, and then she later on adds, I was disobedient. She says it. So here, if you put it all together, what do you find? That yes, those above her in the institution, those authorities who were given power by God and authority, did not exercise it properly. But they were influenced by her disobedience. So it was on the part of both. And I've heard people read this passage about Louise and say, oh, the priests were so bad, but they don't see the full context, you see. So when we talk about establishing peace among each other in the divine will, we have to bear in mind this principle, which is extremely important. People want peace, but they don't want to obey. It's impossible. It's impossible. You can preach the divine will all you want, but if you don't obey the magisteria, if you don't obey the papacy, you're gone. You're never going to be united. You're not even going to be living in God's will ever on earth. You can't do the two. So I want to make this very clear because we have a lot of people out there with pipe dreams. They want to live according to their own standard and at the same time demand peace according to their own. So it's not going to happen. You can't have it both ways. And Louisa is the example to follow. She learned that if I do not obey those above me, and she did disobey the priest, she said that sometimes, initially in her teen years, and that caused problems with them, then you're never going to have unity. And Jesus, sometimes she had disobeyed too. This is in the earlier years, because remember, she's learning, she's young, and Jesus is extremely patient because he knows that she's a teenager. And uh, I'll give you one episode. I think I found it yet. Okay, this comes from volume one. The seventh article is broken down according to articles. She talks about the struggle she's going through with obedience, with those above her and with Christ who's above her. And she adds, I tried to do as much as I could to please Jesus. I would try to decrease, to annihilate myself, and sometimes I would reach the point of almost feeling myself disappear, whereby if he did not sustain me, I could neither work nor take one step or even one breath. Now, let me talk about what the word annihilate means and what disappear means here. In the Italian Apollian expression, the word mi impiccolivo, I, I humbled myself, basically tried to disappear, literally means she made repeated efforts to reduce her size. That's what it means. In Picolivo, reduce her size. Now, with respect to the expression annihilation, not infrequently used in approved mystical literature, this implies a self-emptying, 
a self-renunciation, John of the Cross uses this, or a dying to one's own interests. Louisa often practiced this annihilation or in piccolivo to reduce her size, which involved exercising the virtues, removing all obstacles to God's grace and a total reliance upon him in all things. The depth attained of this reliance was a singular grace that God gave to Louisa commensurate with her singular vocation as the little daughter of the divine will to introduce to the world this gift for all humanity and for the church. Now, with regard to the expression, um, she wanted to, dis she could feel herself disappear, okay? In Italian, it is literally, da sentirmi quasi disfatto l'essere mio. This literally means to the point of almost feeling myself be undone. Okay. And this is again a singular grace that she retained from our Lord that I elaborate more on in the volume one, but to get to the point of her disobeying for a little while, our Lord and the priests, she adds, I could neither work nor take one step or even one breath. I saw myself as such an imp that I was ashamed of being seen by people, knowing that I was the most unsightly one, and in reality, I am still so. Wherefore, I shunned people as much as I could, saying to myself, for I wouldn't tell anyone, oh, if they knew how mischievous I am, and if they could only see how, despite of the graces the Lord has given me, I remain always the same spiritually, and oh, how horrified they would be with me. Then, in the morning, when I would again come to receive communion, it seemed to me that upon entering within me, Jesus rejoiced for the joy he felt in seeing me so annihilated. He would then offer me more words on how to better observe this self-annihilation, but with teachings that always differed from the previous ones. He would always have new ways of expressing the same truth. Here we come to this point. Finally, one day reprimanding me, he said, I do not wish for you to think of such things. Now, what was she thinking of? She was thinking of um, losing time in her past life for her past sins. Before she says, oh Lord, I have lost the time that I could have spent loving you not to mention whatever unknown great, great transgressions I may have committed. Now, Jesus does tell her that she never committed one grave sin. So then the Lord says, I do not wish for you to think of such things. When a soul has humbled itself, is convinced of having done wrong, has cleansed itself in the sacrament of confession, and is ready to die rather than offend me, and still persists in thinking of its past, it offends my mercy, and hinders itself from drawing close to my love. Such a soul constantly entrenches its mind in the mud of the past, thereby preventing me from enabling it to take its flight to heaven. Because this soul is always engrossed in itself, its thoughts return to its past. And yet, I no longer recall any of its past thoughts. Isn't that beautiful? So when Mercy Sunday comes in a six day, what is it, eight days? We are on day two of the Novena of Divine Mercy. Let us remember us, remind ourselves of this. Were this expression of our Lord, he says that, I no longer recall any of its past faults. Now we'll go into the judgment day, right? Where everything will be revealed, how we can reconcile this statement with our Lord who says that, Everything done behind closed doors will be revealed and that when the resurrection of the bodies, the Council of Trent made the statement occurs, everything will be revealed good and bad that any, everyone ever done has ever done. If that's the case, how could Jesus say he forgets everything? Okay. For I am completely, I have for completely forgotten that he has. Do you see any rancor or displeasure on my part? And I replied, no, Lord, you are so good. And then he, with such tenderness, made me feel my heart 
completely melt. And Jesus, now, do you still prefer to pursue the thoughts of the past? And I, no, no, I do not want to. And Jesus, let us then think of loving one another and making each other happy. Now, who could express? Now, then, of course, she talks about the priests. Um, this is a long passage. I started it from the top, so I'm going to skip through it to get to the part where she's going against the Lord and the priests. Um, a great dispute arose among the priests. Some that said that my condition was inauthentic, while others that I deserved a good spanking. Some that I wished to come across as a saint, and yet others that I was possessed. And there were so many other things said that if I were to tell them all, it would take too long to recount. So when my sufferings would occur and my family would call on someone, they, with these ideas in their minds, would strangely make such a scene that my poor family suffered very much, especially my, my poor mom, who shed so many tears for me. O oh Lord, may thou reward her. O oh my go good Lord, how much I suffered on this account. You alone know all. Now, who could express how, my, how embittered I felt from the fact that the priest was required to release me from the state of suffering? How oh so many times I prayed, shedding the most bitter tear that Jesus might release me. And the oh so many times I willingly resisted the Lord. I resisted the Lord when he wanted me to offer up myself as a victim and accept such pains, thus leading me to say, Lord, promise me that you yourself will release me from the state of immobility, and then I will accept everything. Otherwise, no, I do not want to accept this. And I would resist the first day the second day, the third day. But who can resist God? He would reveal to me so many things that in the end I was compelled to submit myself to the cross. At other times I would say to him from the heart and with confidence, Lord, how is it that you have done this? How? Between you and me, you now wish to introduce a third person, whereas this third person does not want to make himself available? You see, we could have been so happy, just the two of us. <laughs> just the two of us. When you wanted me to submit myself to suffering, I immediately accepted it because I knew that you yourself would free me from the state. Now, no, there is no need for another hand to free me. I beseech you, you free me, and then the both of us will be happier. Sometimes Jesus pretended not to hear me and would remain silent. At other times, he would say, do not fear. I am the one who will bring forth darkness and light. The time of light will come. It is my usual way to carry out my works through, priests, through the priests. Now, what does he mean by the time of light will come? Here, Louisa reveals her embarrassment, okay? Um, she relates that many times she thought to avoid company, that she pleaded with our Lord to hide her sufferings from others, that she didn't even want the priest involved because she didn't want anyone to know about her sufferings. She wanted just to be between the Lord and herself. And she was embarrassed that others found out about it and implored the Lord that this would not continue. Then the Lord tells her, you don't understand this now, but you will come to understand why the priest is needed why this authority of this institution that Christ established is required. Now, the light Jesus refers to is the light of knowledge that Louisa will later require regarding the essential role of the priests in her life. More than any other mystic in the history of the church, Louisa was not able to do anything without the priest. There's never been any other mystic in the life of the church. So associated with a holy order of priesthood than Louisa. Now, what does this mean? Why does Jesus make it this way? I'll give you the answer. 
in two volumes, April 23rd, sorry, volume 23, April 18th, 1930, and volume 15, July 11th, 1923. First, volume 23, April 18th, 1930. Jesus tells Louisa, by God accomplishing everything in one single soul, all other souls would acquire the right to our divine acts, meaning the Trinity's acts, through one soul. He illustrates how by his accompanying all of Adam's first acts, all human acts were to have life. And how the same principle applies to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to Louisa. First, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Jesus tells her, tells Louisa, did not the same thing happen with my own redemption? Because the sovereign queen of heaven had the best of and of giving birth to me, all other creatures acquired the right to the blessings of redemption. So through Adam, all received the divine will. And through his original sin, we all received original sin. Through Mary, we all received the gift of redemption. Naturally, God's involved in both Adam and Mary. Then he adds in volume 15, July 11th, 1923. You too are unique, Louisa, in my mind and will be unique in history. Neither before nor after you will there be another creature, neither before nor after you will there be another creature whom I will bind by necessity to the assistance of my priests. having chosen to deposit within you the holiness, the goods, and the effects, that the acts of my supreme will and the acts of my supreme will, it was fitting, righteous, and honorable for the very holiness that my will contains, that a priest assist you and be the first male depository of the goods that my will contains. The first male depository, meaning Hannibal and conveys them from his soul to the entire mystical body of the church. We, the three divine persons, entrusted my mother to St. John, the priest, in order to deposit in him and from him to the church the treasures, the graces, and all of my teachings throughout the course of my life. Mary being entrusted to me and I entrusting her to the priest, St. John, deposited in her as in a sanctuary all the laws, the precepts, and the doctrines that the church is to possess. And she deposited them in my faithful disciple, St. John the Priest, whereby she, my mother, exercises primacy over the entire church. I have done the same with you, Louisa. I, entrusting you to me, and placing you at the service of the Fiat Voluntas Tua for the entire church, entrusted you to one of my priests, Saint Hannibal, so that you might deposit in him all that which I manifested to you about my will. You understand now? So the priest is essential for us to live in the divine will. And therefore, the obedience that Louisa first resisted, eventually she, she submitted herself to. And later Jesus would reveal why. So at the time she resisted, Jesus said, I am the one who dispenses darkness and light, but the time for light will come. It came in this message. It didn't come at that time in volume one, which was when she was about 17 years old writing that. It came later in volume 15 and again in volume 23. And volume 15 was 1923, right? So she was much older then. And that's when the light came for her to understand why the priest was necessary. So going back to uh, the, the document uh, from the Vatican on um, peace on earth, article 46 states that God has created man social by nature and a society cannot hold together unless someone is in command to give direction 
and unity of purpose. Hence, every civilized community must have a ruling authority. And this authority, no less than society itself, has its source in nature and consequently has God for its author. But it must not be imagined that an authority knows no bounds since its starting point is the permission to govern in accordance with the right reason. There is no escaping the conclusion that it derives its binding force from the moral order, which in turn has God as its origin and end. Hence, to quote Pope Pius XII, the absolute order of living beings and the very purpose of man have a direct bearing upon the state as a necess necessary community endowed with the authority, down with authority. Divest of its authority and rulers, it is nothing. It is lifeless. That's a call for confession at the church here. You heard that bell ring. Give me one second. I want to see if there's another piece available. He should be. Oh, good. I can, I'm talking. Someone's here. Oh, yeah, I said I was going to ask you to ask questions. So let me conclude this and open the floor very quickly. Um, uh, by right reason, and above all things, uh, the authorities are to make it clear that such an order can have no other origin but in God, a personal God, our creator. And from him derives the dignity, <clears throat> the unity, and the common good of all. So basically, authority comes from God down to us through love, amoris. Then we exemplify that love through our neighbor, through caritas, through charity. How? Not just this way. Remember I said earlier, it was like a heart going like this. So the authority goes from God, the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the papacy, to the bishops, to the priests, to the religious, to the laity. And then they all go back. And there's therefore a hierarchy on earth of unity and love. This is the moral order. So if someone is preaching the divine will or, or wanting to preach or live in the divine will, they cannot separate themselves from this hierarchical structure that God put in order. Okay? And that is why in recent times I put out a charter statement that has now been embraced. And I'm going to be sending in through the MHT staff, another email out on the updated version, because now it's an official corporation. We waited a little while for it to be a corporate, now it's an official corporation. And it's at the service of the church. We have two bishops that are aware of it, and we're asking them to continue to support it. And it's in two countries, three countries already. And we have about, oh, so close to over 3,000 people. Um, and uh, several hundred priests. And what we're doing is we're following this pattern of unity through love, charity, and obedience to a religi religious authority. So I understand that people want everyone to get together to pro promote the divine will together. But you tell me, can you do this if people are disobeying the Pope and promoting the divine will? Can you do this if people are attacking the magisterium and promoting the divine will? Can you do this when people are not even consulting with priests or authorities in the church and promoting the divine will? Can you do that? Tell me how. That's the challenge. So if someone says, why don't we just get together and all promote the divine will together? I'm 100% for that, but... There's a condition. The condition is you obey. If you don't obey, you're just playing a game and going nowhere. Yes, you can get together and sing cool by our, but how far does that get you when it comes to growing in the divine will? I mean, that's just, uh, that's really just praying to yourself if you're not following obedience. You can do trust throws and hug trees all you want, but unless you follow this, this pattern of, <laughs> of this direct descent of love followed by caritas, that, that submits your will, dies to your will, 
to give it to those whom God has put above you who are responsible before God. And there can be no unity. See, I want to make this very clear in this triduum. Love follows, up. it follows conditions, it follows um, a moral order that God put in place. Oh, there can be no unity without obedience. It's impossible. I'll open up the floor to any questions you may have. Father, I have a question to start off the questions. And if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand. Father, I'm going to ask you to, uh, for words of guidance and for words that provide an understanding for people within divine will groups today. Um, and the sort of trials and tribulations that they're experiencing today. You know, Father, many people really desired Louisa to be declared a saint already. And then there was mm -hmm. a pause yeah. to the cause. There was yeah. such an effort to promote Louisa to especially alt-right traditionalist groups. And yet we see a lot of traditionalist alt-right people taking the social media, not only to attack Louisa, but to shame anyone with the Louisian devotion. We also have divine will leaders who have been caught up in scandal and ethical actions, anti-papal rhetoric, even divine will leaders who are recanting Louisa saying she's too controversial. How do we make sense of this when it feels like the divine will movement is falling apart? Number one, the divine will movement is in the hands of God. And remember, the movement as such does not include rebels, does not include rebels. Look at the, look before answering the second part of your question of how to deal with it. Look at the uh, early Christian community of the apostles in Christ. You had a bad apple in there, right? Christ did not throw him out right away because Christ was waiting for him to convert, just like he did with Peter. And Peter did, but you just didn't. You had, at the early, shortly after the resurrection of Christ, a heretical movement within the Catholic Church. Now, this is, you may call it at the time of Christ, the Catholic movement, like you call it the divine will movement. Within that movement of Catholicism, which did not have the name yet, you had Gnostics who were promoting an anti-Christian message that was spreading far and wide. It was going, it was taken on like fire. Sort of like these internet followers following these blind guides that are disobedient to the magisterium. Same thing with the Gnostic heresy. It was taking with its sweep many, that tens of thousands of Christians. And then after that came the Arian heresy, taking in its sweep millions of Christians. And then you had other sects within the church, dividing the church, but they all died. So this movement we're experiencing is little like a little hiccup compared to all these departures from the source of truth at the time of Christ, shortly thereafter, and in the fourth century, the Arians, and then the Jansenists, and the Protestant Reformation, and et cetera, et cetera. So we look back to learn from the past, to find out how to deal with it. How do you deal with it? St. Paul says, avoid troublemakers. Avoid them. That's the first golden rule of thumb. Do not associate with them. St. Paul goes so far as to say, turn them over to Satan so that they will be mortified and learn and hopefully through their shame, not shame, but guilt, confess, come back. What is he saying here? Don't waste or misplace your love. You have to preach the truth and love and stand your ground with the truth. Remember with Christ, when he's talked to them about his body and blood, he said, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life. And what happened? Many left. The setting is too hard for us to stomach. The majority of the disciples left. So this is at the time before the tw the, they were reduced to 12. At the, they might, they, he had close to 100 at the time, and many of them left. And then he turned to Peter and he said, will you leave me too? 
And Peter said, Lord, who are we to go to? You have the words of eternal life. What did Jesus say? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me preach you what you want. No, it's not the way to do it. You stand your ground. Be anchored in the truth. So when you have these people coming into the dual movement that are perverting it with disobedience, and that's the proper word, they're perverting it. They're making it their will, their theology. They wanted to direct the church into the pre-Vatican era or into the ultra-conservatives or ultra-liberals. Don't go there. They're blind guys leading you into the pit. Both will fall. Follow the unchanging perennial doctrine of Christ as transmitted to the apostles and preached by the doctors and fathers and explicated by the magisterium and Louisa's writings approved thereby. So how do we deal with that? We follow those authorities that are sanctioned by the church, that are accredited, that are qualified. Not this bloke that comes off the street appearing on the internet with his own blog saying, hey, everybody, I know how to teach the divine will. And then he starts to interject, oh, don't listen to this, don't listen to what the, the church says there. By what authority are you telling us to do this? So what do we do? We avoid them, we stay our ground, we follow the truth, which comes from the church, and we pray for them. Jesus said, pray for those who mistreat you, who hate you, and so forth. That's the pattern to follow. Thank you, Father. Steve-O, yeah. do you have a question, Steve? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, Father. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of uh, Louise's writing, she talks about when she prays, she uh, literally puts on the wounds of Christ and then uh, the thorns on her head, and she doesn't know whether it's good or it's bad, bad in that way of prayer. And Jesus does say that she should continue to pray in that way. But is, is that imaginative or is that? No, like it's real. But it's called in theology a mystical transport. You know, where the soul leaves the body, but it's still in the body. But the body would be rigid, immobile, and, and irresponsive to external stimuli. Having said that, Jesus at that time when her soul would be with him, would place the crown of thorns upon her head. And she could feel it exactly as her, in her body. Consider, for example, the souls in purgatory, heaven, or hell. Do you think they don't have any sensorial experience because their bodies are in the grave? Of course not. Just because their bodies are in the grave doesn't mean that they have no sense or feeling in heaven. They do. Because the soul is experiencing all that. So Louisa goes through what basically happens when a soul leaves the body at the moment of death. It goes immediately to its place of destiny, either heaven, hell, or purgatory, and experiences the full gamut of all that which is present in that place. Naturally, it will increase on the general judgment when the body accompanies it. But between then, it's burial, and now, in the general judgment, it has this beatific vision, or this eternal damnation, or this suffering in purgatory. Louisa would experience that exactly as if it were in her body. And to show that this is true, when Jesus would take her, she would be walking with him, with her sort of like an ethereal body. It was not a material body, but it was a body that accompanied her soul that had all the senses of smell, taste, hearing, sight, touch, that when she came back, her socks would have holes in them. But she never left her bed. Wow. So, so yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mirren, go ahead, Mirren. Okay. Um, Father Yanusi, you, am I audible? Yes. You mentioned that I will just read my question because I'm nervous. You mentioned that don't authority. Be the only time to be <laughs> nervous is when your parents are disciplining you. <laughs> okay. You mentioned By the way, before that... you read your question, before you read your question, okay. I always have to get a little bit of a joke in every talk because I like I think humor is a good relief <laughs> as long as it's a, a clean, good, divine sense of humor. Um, what's the difference between um, in Latin, there are two words for fear, or I'll use the Italian to make it more modern. You have timori, so timore, fear of God, and then paura, which is fright. So what's the difference in English between fright um, or, or, or let me put it, in, I guess English would be dread. What is the difference between dread and fear? And I said to a priest who asked me this several years ago, 
fear is what you lend to God. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Dread is what you lend to your superiors. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. <laughs> I get that. I have superiors all my life. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's my question. It has to do with authority. Eh? So, um, you, you mentioned that authority in the church influences or impacts the members of the church. Did I get that right? Yes. What will happen if the Pope himself becomes the Antichrist, as some would purport that that is the third secret of Fatima? Yeah. I'm sure. Then, uh, then you know, I'll uh, get a couple of tickets to Bermuda. <laughs> no, basically, the Pope cannot be the Antichrist. Okay? It's a uh, teaching of the church, all right? That it's you can go to the first Vatican Council. All right, see the people who say this don't know their theology nor the, this is a doctrinal unchanging teaching of the church. If you would like, um, I could pull it up for you and read it to you, this, this unchanging teaching of the church. Okay, from the first Vatican Council, here it comes. And I'll give you first the source and I'll give you the exact quotation. This comes from the first Vatican Council, chapters two through four. And it states as follows. Now, the First Vatican Council happened between 1869 and 1870. That which our blessed Lord established in the blessed apostle Peter for the continual salvation and permanent benefit of the church must of necessity remain forever. This is the office of the papacy. By Christ's authority in the church, which founded as it is upon a rock, will stand firm until the end of time. Blessed Peter, this is the papacy, Peter represents the papacy, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ. To this day and forever, he, Christ, lives and presides and exercises judgment in his successors, here's the key word, whoever, whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains the primacy of Peter over the whole church so that the truth has ordained, stands firm, and blessed Peter preserves in the rock-like strength he was granted and does not abandon the guidance of the church which he once received. There it is. So number one, whoever succeeds to the chair of Peter obtains the primacy of the whole church. And two, whoever it is, does not, doesn't say may not, says does not, that's a guarantee, abandon the guidance of the church which he once received. And it continues. To the Roman pontiff in blessed Peter and his successors, full power has been given by our Lord Jesus Christ to tend to rule to govern the universal church, both the clergy and the faithful of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collective, are bound to submit to his power by the duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience. And this not only in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in those which regard the discipline of the church and government of the church, not politics or weather or vaccines, nothing of that, he has no authority there but everything concerning the church, faith, morals, discipline, and government of the church. Throughout the world, he is the supreme judge of the faithful. The Roman pontiff possesses the supreme power of teaching, that is, that saying of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, cannot fail of its effect. The Catholic religion has always and will always be preserved unblemished, unquote. That's from the first Vatican Council. The second Vatican Council adds this, and I'll close with this. The bishops, when they are teaching in communion with the Roman pontiff, are to be respected by all as witnesses of the divine and Catholic faith. The religious assent of the will and intellect is to be given in a special way to the authentic teaching authority of the pontiff. Okay? So the bishops have to be in union with him to have authority. If they don't, not, they have no authority. And we have to submit ourselves to his authority and faith, moral, faith, morals, discipline, and governments 
he will, then whoever it is that succeeds the chair will never fail. So no, the Pope can never be an antichrist. It's against church doctrine and that cannot change. Thank you for asking. So no ticket to Bermuda. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you. You're welcome. Father, I want to take a moment and thank you for providing us this online retreat entitled The Unity in Divine Will. Uh, thank you for taking time for doing this and being a part of thousands of people's Lenten and Holy Week journey. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Father. Everyone appreciates it. My pleasure. God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Glory and Father. Thank you. Buona Pasqua, grazie. Buonasera. From your hometown, Milano. Oh, Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you. Happy Easter, thank you. Happy Easter, everyone. God bless you. God bless you.